Hello everyone, Simon here with pack to live and today we are taking a look at one of many super light camp bed products that you can find on the internet. Uh, the idea is that they are a, a framed camp bed that uh, packs down incredibly small, weighs very very little, uh, but on the flip side tend to be quite a pain in the ass to put up. There are many different versions of this product on the internet, or rather I should say they're all the same product. They come under many different brand names. Uh, some brands you may know, some brands you probably have never heard of. In fact, almost certainly haven't. This one was from a, a Chinese brand or a Chinese company that I'd never heard of. And I figured, you know, at 30 pounds, 35 pounds, I'll give it a go. If, uh, if it works for me, I'll keep it. If not, I'll send it back. It's not fit for purpose. So I bought one and here it is in my hand right now. I have used this quite a lot lately. Um, for the last nearly a year, I've been ground dwelling um, as often as possible rather than hammocking in an attempt to up my game with the ground dwells, the different types of tents, the different types of ground pitches for tarps, and of course ways of being comfortable and warm on the ground. And I did that on purpose because for many, many years now, up until last year, I'd been hammocking almost exclusively and very seldom ever spent a night on the floor. I figured it was time for a change. It was time for me to uh, repractice my ground skills as it were and to develop new ones. So I've spent the last almost 12 months exactly sleeping on the ground with a couple of exceptions where the ground hasn't been suitable and I've done a couple of nights in trees in my hammocks. Okay, so the camp bed was one of the many things I figured I'd give a go. Now, I own several different types of camp bed. I have the army standard one, uh, which I got from a surplus store, uh, which is heavy, it's steel, it's bulky, it takes up a lot of space. Uh, I have a regatta that I picked up for my children when we went to Wales last year, and that's even bigger and even heavier than the army version, but the same basic principle, poles that go through a stretcher bed style material and a series of individual springed pieces, uh, like a, a U shape that go in underneath to form the slats that go on the floor. This is a different methodology entirely. The idea of this is that it's very lightweight and very, very compact. So it packs down to a rather small size, as you can see here. It's not at all heavy. I have a NeoAir down mat, one of the super light versions, and this weighs only a couple of hundred grams more, which actually is not as much as you might think. So attaching this to my pack, it really doesn't make much of a difference to the weight in terms of what you'd feel and what you'd notice. Whereas attaching an army style or a regatta, one of the traditional camp beds to your pack, you really, really do feel that extra weight. So the first thing to notice with this is the particular way I've packed it. Now, all of these individual pieces, which I'll show you in more detail in a moment, they slot together. And what I've done is I've done three groupings of what are essentially the feet. And I've arranged one at one end, one at the other, and another in the middle. Now, the reason I've done it this way is so that the roll, when it's packed up, is an even diameter all the way down the length. And if I put my straps for attaching it to my bag between the two, with the compression on the top of the bag, none of this is going to fall out anywhere and it will stay rigidly attached to my pack. So that's why I pack it that way. I'm going to start disassembling this now and show you what we get. Okay, so first of all, we have the feet. There are four, uh, three groups of four, so that'd be 12 individual pieces for the feet which, as I said before, they clip together. So as you can see, these are clipped together. We just unclip them. And what I'm going to do now is pair them off into twos. And the reason for that, of course, is because each slat has two feet. OK, so we have the feet. We also have the fabric that forms the actual bed itself. It's very much like a stretcher style bed in terms of the material, very strong, uh, sort of a nylon material in this particular case. I think certain models and certain brands use a slightly different variants of material. Uh, it's a ripstop. It has the ripstop square pattern sewn in. We now have a bunch of these poles. One pole is an orange colour in this particular model and another is green. These form a mated pair. They slot together to form a spring pole. 
and obviously that plays a very important part in the way this is assembled. We'll go into that in more detail in a minute. What I'm going to do at the moment is quickly put them together and pair them off. And what I'm going to do as I put them down on the floor, I'm going to put each one in an alternate direction. So we have green, orange, orange, green, then green, orange, orange, green, and so on in that fashion. And this will make it quicker and easier for me to assemble when I'm putting it together in a few minutes. Okay, then we have two sets of these folded bars. These are just aluminium rods that are thicker than the others with a green stopper on this model in each end. Those are to stop the poles from tearing through the bottom of the fabric. And they are attached together like a tent pole on elastic. So they slot together and form a single long rigid pole. Okay, so once again, we have a little bit of a glory shot of all of the materials. That's the uh, bag that everything packs into. We have the material for the bed itself, all of the feet in groups of twos, all of the slat rails, which are effectively spring poles here, alternating colors, orange, green, green, orange, and so on in this particular model, all the way down. And then the two lateral poles that run through the length of the material to uh, give us the frame for the bed itself, which is what we start with now. So we'll take one of the poles, and now these can be fiddly to put together, but they are not difficult. Unlike an army camp bed, uh, the end, one end of each of the long runners is open on this. And that's because the springed feet hold the pole inside so that it doesn't slide back out the open ends. So all I'm gonna do, and I do hope the camera catches this, but it is quite awkward because I'm on my own today filming. All I'm gonna do is slide the pole through the end and then run it all the way through, making sure it doesn't come out of any of these holes that are along the seam on the end here. And then as I go, I'm just going to attach the next section of the pole and feed it f further through. So as I say, fiddly, but very, very simple. So as you can see, it is just a case of feeding the poles through and making sure they don't come through, the end doesn't come through any of the holes and that it slides through. There are some ways they could have improved upon this design quite easily in my view and made it easier to run this pole in without it coming through the holes. But uh, all of them seem to share the same design flaw, every single one of them, no matter what the model name or the brand name or whatever you want to call it. They're all the same basic product. They're all the same basic materials. They're all the same exact design. So even the expensive Thermarest version of this product has the same design flaw with these holes being too easy for the pole to guide through rather than go behind as this cheap model that I have here. Now, a good reason why I've gone with a cheap model rather than an expensive model is because I had no idea what to expect with this bed and this design of bed so if i'm going to outlay some 140 pounds with a company like Thermarest for a product i want to make sure the concept in and of itself is actually worth paying for do you know what i mean it this one is um oh it actually says it on it there we go that's handy this is the brs model it says it here in the logo Never heard of BRS, but they are fundamentally a cheap Chinese firm that makes a living from doing a cheaper knockoff version of a brand name product that's manufactured in the same factories. Before I get on to start doing the legs, I will say a couple of vital statistics. One is this has a rated weight limit of 200 kilos. This model, um, you will not be able to use this bed if you weigh 200 kilos. Actually, if you weigh more than 110 kilos, you will not be able to use this bed. It will bend, it will break. I can tell you that for an absolute fact. Uh, the first time I laid on this bed, I weighed 74 kilos. Uh, that was my naked weight without clothing. So with my clothing, we'll call it 75 kilos all in, plus the sleeping bag, so 76. So just shy of 80 kilos altogether on this bed, when I first lay on it and it warped slightly. Um, there, was a, there is a fundamental flaw in the instructions that come with these beds, which I'll get to in a moment with you, that completely changes the way they behave. If you follow the instructions that come with it and you are not a very heavy person, i.e. if you don't weigh around the 100 kilo mark, then you are going to break the bed. 
If you weigh more than 110 kilos, then I strongly recommend, well, A, not buying this bed, because I don't think it will be strong enough for you and it will not last, or buy the bed and buy an additional set of the spring poles and legs. Oh, sorry, um, just the spring poles, you don't need any extra legs. Uh, although you can buy four extra feet, four of the extra feet, and four, uh, eight additional poles, and make use of two additional strut mounting positions for heavier people to give it more strength. But if you buy just an additional set of the spring bars, the slats, these here in my hand, these legs, these feet, are designed to take two sets. They have a hole here and a hole there through which two sets of spring poles can be run. Now, when you buy these, the instructions say that for the two center struts, the two center leg positions, to use two sets of poles and cross them over. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So we run one through here. We run one through here. And then take the opposing foot upside down and run one through each hole Hang on, this is very, very fiddly, but there we go. Hang on, into the end. And then twist them. It says to do that and actually twist the legs around. Now, if you do that, if you're a heavy person and you do that for each leg of the bed, then it will reinforce it massively. It'll make it a lot stronger. If you weigh less than 100 kilos, certainly if you weigh less than 80 kilos, you don't need to do this. And if you do this only on the center two struts, on the center legs here and here, the bed will bend on this side and on this side of the center legs. That's exactly what it did to me the first time I used it. And I was actually out camping with my friend Bob from Bob's Bushcraft on YouTube here. And uh, we woke up in the morning and noticed immediately that the bed had bent on either side of the center. It also made for a very uncomfortable night because it was providing way too much support just in the middle where the lower lumbar and my top of my butt basically was sitting and my legs were flopping down and my upper torso was flopping down towards the ground as well. So it makes it far less comfortable and it makes it warp and bend. You don't want that in a bed. So all you need to do is what I've done, which is taken two sets of these poles away from the kit and left them at home. I don't need them with me and only use on every strut, every leg, one pair of poles like that. We run them through the top hole, the one nearest the hook at the top here. I'll give you a closer look at this in a second and attach it through here. And then we take the other one in the same direction above the bottom. So up near, so on the top side of the vertical bar, sorry, the horizontal bar that runs across, we run it through and that's one set of legs ready to go. Now I'm going to bring this closer to the camera and just give you a closer look. Then I'm going to reorient everything and start fitting these to the bed. Okay, so just to give you a closer look, I've gone above this plastic divider in the middle of each leg, uh, each foot I should say, and that's on the side with the hook. And this hook will connect to the lateral struts that run through the fabric that we fitted a moment ago. And again, on this side, the same thing. I've gone above and that's it, that's one pair of legs ready to go. So I'm gonna reorient the camera now and I'll show you how we fit these to the bed. Okay, so while there's no defined order in which to in install the legs on the bed, the ends obviously make sense. It doesn't matter which end you use. Uh, what I tend to do though, is I go for the opening end and I pop the legs on first because it makes it impossible for then these bars to slide out. So we just take one of the hook sides and push it up against the pole and then if you use your knees or your legs or your feet and you lean on the bed and we just pop it into place like that you'll see that there's a curve in the pole uh, there's a curve in the pole which acts like a spring so when the feet are pressed down this provides the counter tension for your body weight on the other side of the sheet pressing down on it uh, we take the next set of legs, and in this particular case, this model has an additional pair of uh, cutouts for another set of feet here and on the same position on the opposing side. We skip those and go straight down to these. 
alternate the direction of the spring poles. I, I always feel that gives a better possibility of strength because they're not equidistant. The join position is offset to one side of each set of spring poles. So we, off, we counter their direction each time we put them in. Okay, and then just pop that one in there. It doesn't take very much strength at all to bend these legs into position. Putting it together is a lot easier force-wise than taking it apart. When you take it apart, you kind of have to lean on it, lean a knee on this side, put one hand up here, one hand under the pole, lift and pull. And you'll see that that came out very easily. It didn't fly towards my face and it was actually very straightforward. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna repeat all the way down, alternating the direction of the two poles all the way down to the other end. And now I'm down to the last pair. Very, very simple process. As you can see from this video, this only took a couple of minutes to actually assemble. I've spent vastly more time talking to you than I have actually putting it together. So I reckon the average assembly time for this is about three to five minutes. And of course, the more you practice, the quicker that gets. So that's done. Flip it over and we have a bed. She's incredibly lightweight. See how easy that is to lift from one end. It floats to the ground gently and is strong enough to hold my weight. Lay down. And I am actually quite comfortable already. Obviously with a pillow and all the precouperments of a bed, I'd be even more comfortable, but it doesn't take much. Okay, so there are a few major advantages about this type of bed. Uh, the first one is you don't have to blow into anything. Um, it's not an inflating bed. It can be used instead of an inflating mat. Uh, the assembly time is only a couple of minutes, so sort of three to five minutes. And of course, the more you practice, the quicker and quicker you'll get at being able to put this thing together. Taking it apart is slightly slower because of course the rigidity of the product is decreasing the more you take it apart. So the more you dismantle, the uh, more floppy and, and sort of unwieldy the bed becomes. So I reckon disassembly takes between five and seven minutes uh, with pack down included. But the assembly side is the bit that matters most. It's slow disassembly and pack down is not as important as being able to get your bed in place, ready to use efficiently. This ticks that box perfectly. Uh, the weight, as I've said before, and is very low. I'll show it on the screen again in grams just to give you some idea of how light this thing is. Uh, all packed down, it's very compact, attaches to the side of a Bergen or a rucksack very, very easily. Uh, the top and the bottom of a rucksack just as easily still. Uh, I have it attached to my pack frame that I carry with me, my little pack rabbit mule. I just stick it on top of the frame and tighten the straps and it stays put. Never had a problem. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put a couple more adornments on this bed and give you an idea of how it looks with a sort, sort of a full bed setup. It's more of a glory shot than anything else, but to give you some idea. So to get it started, I've put down a proper, genuine reindeer hide on the bed itself, just to give some additional warmth. Now, any raised bed, i.e. a bed that doesn't directly put your body in contact with the floor and has a gap for air, is going to offer some insulating properties in and of itself. Just by not losing your heat, your body heat to direct conduction with the floor is going to keep you quite warm. Now, obviously an inflating mat does that by using a cavity filled with air to keep you elevated. And that's, that works very, very well, in particular because the air inside of an inflating mat doesn't move. Obviously air can move underneath one of these and so it won't offer the same degree of thermal protection as an inflating mat. In the summer, in the spring, summer and autumn in particular in the UK at least, the temperatures are so high anyway that it won't really matter. You'll never really notice. Uh, in the winter, when the temperatures dip below the freezing uh, point, then you may, especially on a windy night. 
So obviously a reindeer hide is sort of a nice analog alternative to an inflating mat. Um, this is just me being fancy and splash and lavish, but I have this reindeer hide and I do like it. I've laid it down on there. Now, inside this dry bag, I have um, my summer sleeping bag. It's all I really need in the summer because the temperature is warm enough. And I've put it inside a compression dry bag. Now, the reason I use compressible dry bags rather than the original stuff sacks alone is because obviously a dry bag is waterproof, whereas the stuff sacks that a lot of products come in simply aren't. And this sleeping bag is no exception. This is a Kelty uh, down bag, Trail Logic SB20, sorry, sorry, SBEN20. So SB means sleeping bag, and the EN20 is the kit of which this is usually used as a part. I have the sleeping bag on its own. Uh, it comes in a telecompression stuff sack and what telecompression means is that it compresses vertically the compression stuff sack that i'm using compresses horizontally so not only do i get an advantage of waterproofing with this stuff sack which weighs bugger all by the way but i also have the advantage of being able to compress it both vertically and horizontally so that it fits in any pack in any configuration now I should say, when I'm not using the reindeer hide, I do also have uh, several different inflating mats that I use. Uh, this one here is the Neo Air down mat, the super light version of the down filled uh, inflatable mat. Incredibly warm. When it comes to a pillow, uh, you've got loads of options. You can take a dry bag, one of the stuff sacks, any of that, just shovel your clothing in and use it underneath. And I'll be honest with you, when I'm carrying my winter gear, that tends to be what I do, because I'm already carrying a greater weight for the insulation that I need in the winter. I don't see the point in carrying a pillow as well. However, I went to, uh, funnily enough, Poundland a couple of weeks ago, because I was looking, I've been looking and focusing on low price gear and how effective that gear is. Again, I bought the cheap model of the bed. Um, so I'm, I'm starting to look at lower priced uh, items and whether or not they're actually any good or how they rate against their more expensive counterparts. Uh, this low price bed, once you understand how it goes together, you understand a few of its niggles and traits, like I've mentioned to you here, things like don't follow the instructions that come with it because they don't bloody work and you'll break it. Um, if you're above the weight limit, find something else or buy a second set of the spring bars that I showed you a moment ago when we were putting it together. Once you understand those little tips, you're saving yourself a lot of money. So if you need a raised camp bed or if you just want one and you don't want to spend a great deal of money, why buy the Thermarest when you can buy a cheaper off-brand model that works just as well, or at least I'm pretty sure it works just as well. It works. There's This design is the same, so I don't see how a Thermarest version with a more expensive price tag could work any better than this cheap knockoff. Anyway, so I have, as I was saying, I went to Poundland and they are selling inflatable pillows in their short, small range of camping gear, and it is a very small range. Most of what they're selling I looked at and thought, well that's crap, uh, that, that's not particularly useful to anybody, but I thought, well it's an inflating pillow that packs down to nothing, weighs nothing, it's cheap, it's a pound, obviously it's Poundland. And so I pick one up. I've used it a couple of times and it works. So I'm not, I'm not gonna bother inflating it at the moment actually because I'm gonna be moving all this in a minute anyway. But yeah, so we have an inflated pillow. Boom, you inflate it, you lay it down there. Bingo, pillow, sleeping bag, insulation underneath. What more do you need? So as always, uh, questions are always welcomed. Happy to answer any questions you have. I'm pretty confident that I've covered all the bases in this video about the key points of this, uh, this camp bed. Um, in terms of its worth, you know, again, I do think it's probably not worth spending the ridiculous sum on the expensive Thermarest version of this camp bed. Are there better camp bed designs out there? Uh, there are more robust ones for sure. You know, the Regatta one would probably survive a nuclear war, whereas this one, uh, it's not fragile per se, but, you know, it, I could see certain situations in which I suppose it could break. Plastic feet in particular, uh, if they get cold enough to become brittle or if they get heated up then cooled or cooled then heated, 
could potentially break, I imagine. Um, however, in, in my case, they haven't, and they show no sign of particular wear. I like the fact that the feet are rounded because that means they don't tear through the fabric of a tent or a ground sheet, uh, whereas the ones that end on sort of stoppered feet, they, they, I have actually had occasions where I've damaged polypropylene ground sheets uh, by the legs poking a hole through. Not an issue you'll have with this. The weight distribution is very good across the number of legs that it has. Uh, there's no pressure points, essentially. No one point should have too much pressure on it. Now, obviously, if you're camping on a hill <laughs> or on a bumpy ground, then it's possible that one elevation may be higher on one leg than on the others, and you may increase the relative pressure there. But one of the great advantages of these camp beds is that you can lay on slightly uneven ground and you're still laying flat and level because your weight is simply distributed across the overall number of feet that there are and therefore it, it's sort of self-leveling to an extent. Obviously if you camp on a, a heavy gradient you're going to feel the gradient and if you've got huge ruts and bumps in the ground you're going to feel those too. But on, on relatively uneven ground, sort of slightly bumpy ground, this will give you a level, equal, comfortable lay. So it's worth it for that as well. As always, thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.